Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through my Curse of Strahd campaign for the Shadow Dark RPG. This is episode 15, the finale. We did it, we finished the campaign. <laughs> we got to the end. Man, it was incredible. It, unbelievable, actually. In in a in a very serious way, I'm like very shocked, very surprised. It went super well. It was very, very fun. Now we're gonna do one more session. Um Next, I don't know, maybe next weekend or something like that. We're not sure exactly when, but it's basically not going to be a session. We're not going to roll any dice. Basically, it's going to be like a session zero at the end. It's going to be an epilogue. Um, for our session zero, we did a lot of like narration and like what would have happened and what do you think? Did this character do that? Oh, this would have been cool. And we just kind of like started off the story that way. And so I think we're going to do that for the end. We're going to do an epilogue without dice rolling where I'm not you know, telling how things went, but rather like just a conversation between the players and me about like, you know, where things would have gone after that. Because it ended in a great moment, a natural ending for a story, for the story. It ended really, really well. But there's still questions that they might have. What happened here? What happened with this character? What are we going to do with that? And so I think we'll, we'll, we'll just do a fun little like recap, you know, retrospective and all that stuff. And I'll probably do an episode or a video, I should say after that where i go through my own thoughts about what i did in the campaign you know what could have been better what what i could have done um what i thought went really well all that but honestly guys this has been just as a quick over overview this has been some of the most fun role-playing games D D, whatever you want to call it that i've ever run that i've ever played the whole campaign i mean there were definitely low points where things were a little draggier things were a little low but for the most part we didn't run into that and it was pretty much just you know great session after fun session after fun session so i'm i'm just really really pleased with how it went um yeah that's kind of it was kind of uh it kind of um impressive kind of mind-boggling um so i think in the last one the players had just defeated those glass gargoyles and the party had been really reduced to almost nothing and I remember that I, I had said, and, and they had said that at the beginning of the next session, they were going to do a bunch of healing, and they were going to get everybody back up to full, and then that was going to be it. Well, the very first casting of Cure Wounds failed from the priest. He used a luck point, failed again. So they lost healing before anybody had received it. They were still at like one hit point, six hit points. I think the most hit points they had in the party was 14. Two characters, uh, Esmeralda and Anscar, had 14 hit points. Uh, Abner had one. Um, Van Richten had like six. Uh, I think um, Arthur had 10. He was at max because he has only has 10 hit points at level 5. As a thief, he's really low. He's rolled badly for his hit points. Um, and he has low con. So um, he started off really low. He started off with one hit point. I think at level 2, he had like three hit points. <laughs> So, and then I think Varya had like seven or something, and Titus had like six. So basically the party was like one hit, we're dead from anything, basically. We, we got it. We, we, we can't do this. <laughs> that was their feeling. So they started off the session with, whew, we got through the gargoyles. Okay, we're going to heal up and it'll be great. And then immediately they're like, oh, we're doomed. Start off with that lowest low point, and that's man, that's the swing of Shadow Dark and spellcasters in Shadow Dark. Is that swing? It's so visceral, you feel it, and the players feel it. And I was like, Oh, shoot, yeah, they could just all die for one random encounter, knocks down three of them, kills them. So they're like, Well, we got to push on, we got to at least destroy the heart. Now, they had already gotten through the fireplace, they had the keys, they had now defeated the guardians. Uh, to the heart. They just didn't know where it was exactly. So they went into the, the, the bell tower and they climbed up to where the bells were and, and they didn't find it. They couldn't see it. There was just this uh, basically the top of the tower with a little parapet that ran around it and the bell tower above them. And so they explored, they investigated, they went out onto the parapet very carefully because it was rainy. The parapet had like a knee high wall. It was very precarious. They climbed out there very cautiously. They looked up and they saw the door in the top of the other part of the tower that you couldn't get to except by either climbing or by you know, magic or something like that. Um, and so uh, one character had Misty Step. Titus had Misty Step. And so he crawled out very cautiously, Misty Stepped up, and then dropped down a rope. And so Varya climbed uh, behind him. So the two of them went to the door, the glass door with the three keyholes. And they were like, I really hope there's not a fight in here because if there is, it's just two of us because they didn't want to risk everybody else climbing up because they had to make checks every time. And if they fell, they could fall. So they had kind of secured a couple people with ropes, which turned out to be a very good thing. 
and they climbed in and they unlocked this, this glass tower. And I described how as each key turns in the lock, it shatters. And the, and the door, the door kind of cracks around the key. Uh, and so they opened up the door, the glass door with all these many colored glass, and it broke. No one got cut or anything like that, but it shattered. And inside was this seemingly, you know, like glass dome. It was clearly illusion, clearly, you know, illusion magic, clearly magic of some kind. And they could see out into all corners of Barovia, and it was like a bright sunny day, but it was being filtered through this colored glass. And so there's no mist, there's no fog, it was this beautiful, you know, you could barely hear the storm outside. You could still hear it, but it was deadened, and it was just peaceful and sort of like a, almost in a little ethereal realm. And there was sort of a lifting of, of darkness. Varya felt her curse, like, leave her at the door, basically. And when she walked in, she felt like light for the first time in a long, long time. It was so cool. And it was this moment of like, oh man, peace. And so Varya saw that, oh, and they both saw that there was this glass coffin in the room and inside the glass coffin was the, um, uh, was the remains, or not the remains, but like was the sleeping form. I'm gonna roll, scroll down to it so I can remember. Uh, was the sleeping form of Tatiana inside this glass coffin. And they were like, man, is she the heart? What, what is what is this? What's going on? And uh, Varya could see, because she can see the spirits with her curse, she saw this like ethereal spectral form behind the coffin. And it was this beautiful, bright form. And she was like, okay, so there's something good. It's not, it's not necessarily evil. It's not dark. Uh, and so Titus walked up and he opened up the coffin. And he said in like, I think he said in Barovian or Vistani, uh, what should I do? What do you want? What, 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 what is? And he was trying to, you know, he was trying to like, how do we interact with this? Um, asking the DM, like, how do I interact with this basically? So I, I had the, the voice, it's, I said, it said something like strike. There was a voice of wind through the room. So he grabbed his dagger and he aimed where the heart would be and he just plunged it. And so I said that word. So the, there was a shattering sound and uh, the form in the coffin disappeared and this red glass just like you know, shattered to all corners of the coffin. And immediately uh, the walls of the coffin, the walls of the room shattered in. And uh, like they, they would have been eviscerated by the glass, but the white spectral form like surrounded them and the glass just turned to like water. And then uh, the form just left. Now, as the heart cracked, the entire tower shook, and the entire place shook, and uh, there was a lightning crash and everything. And so people out on the parapet had to roll a check. And I think like Esmeralda and Abner both failed. And so the players tried to respond and it turns out that, oh, actually, you know, I, that they had said, wait, didn't we like um, anchor them? And so I let people roll advantage. And it turns out, you know, they, only Esmeralda fell and they managed to save her. They pulled her back up or Abner almost fell and pulled her back up. So no one actually fell, but if they hadn't anchored them, I think either Esmeralda or Abner would have fallen um, and just died right there. But they managed to destroy the heart, and it was this really cool moment of like, okay, we did it. We did at least that. So if we all die to Strahd, we've at least done a permanent harm to his power, right? So we, we accomplished something. <laughs> Even if we all go down there and we all die in the fight, we have now... Can, broken his connection to the Ur Vampire. Who knows if he can make that again? Not the sort of thing that he can easily do. Um, we imagine. And I, they look for confirmation. And, and Titus is like, look, I've read through the ritual. Is this the sort of thing that he could just easily do again? And I said, no. No, no. You, you don't get the sense that this is something that it will just repeat. That it gave him a portion of its power and that power is now lost. It's not going to be happy. It's not going to be like, oh, well, I'll just try it again. It doesn't like the power returns to it. It's, it's now weakened. They're both weakened. And so now they have, it has, you know, he's, he's not going to get that again. And they were like, okay, good. Um, so we did something. <laughs> that was sort of their consolation. They, they literally, they're like, well, we're dead. We, we have so few hit points. A fight with a vampire, let alone Strahd, we're, we're dead. They were certain of it, or at least... Um, some of them were. So, uh, they, they came down from the tower. They were rolling on random encounter, but they were rolling really low on the underclock die. So it was actually kicking it pretty slowly, which was good for them. And they decided to go straight down. They were like, well, we're in the, the, the they, they went back to the, the, the tower and they were like, let's just go straight down. 
No, it's funny, actually, as they were going there, they passed the Hall of Heroes, and they just completely skipped it. The statues and the uh, everything, they were like, oh yeah, a bunch of statues, and nope, to keep going. So, you know, they didn't go through any of this and see any of the names. They didn't find Lord Sergei, they didn't see the eye, they didn't do any of that. They just had this little thing, and <laughs> they, uh, they just went straight down. So, um... They, they went back to the spire and they went down the spire. All the way down through the tower down to the, um, the, the, the catacombs. Uh, the, uh, the catacombs here. Well, on the way down, um, they rolled a random encounter and they rolled um, the highest they could roll. They rolled a six and this is in the spires down to the catacombs, which was a three. Um, which is, I mean, you add three to the random encounter, which meant that they rolled a, a full-on vampire. So one of one of Strahd, Strahd's like close, so either Escher or the Vistani or Gertruda. There's a Vistani uh, bride, basically. So Escher, Vistani, or or, or Gertruda, and uh, the players had never encountered the uh, the um, the Vistani before. So I I threw her in there. She was crying and she was crawling up the steps, and they were like, um, "Okay, hold out a holy symbol." And so they turned her, or rather, um, the, the priest turned undead, and he turned her successfully. She failed her save, and so she fled down still crying, but fled down. So they, they proceeded down to the bottom of the catacombs, and when they were down there, because it can, with, with a turn undead, it turns them from five turns. So she was only going to go far enough away to, uh, you know, to, uh, to you know, just to watch. <laughs> she was just right there in the darkness. And so I described the catacombs, the oppression, um, the, the mist along the floor. I did away with the bats. There aren't you know, tons and tons of bats down there. Um, but I described how each of these little each of the pillars of Ravenloft was itself a tomb. Um, they could see that there was like a headstone or like a, a, a gravestone, a capstone, that's the way to put it, for each of these pillars. And they could, they're like, well, gosh, where's, where's Strahd? Who knows how, where he is? Because I described how it extended out into darkness and the darkness pressed on the light from their lantern. And uh, they were, you know, they had no idea how big this place was. It probably extended underneath the foundations of the entire castle. And they were like, well, well we just got to search. And it, then at that moment, um, at that moment, uh, the, the, the Vistani attacked. She leapt and attacked. So I roll initiative and uh, they, I think they won. Um, maybe, it was, maybe it was simultaneous initiative, I forget. Regardless, uh, the, the priest attempted to turn on dead again. And I said, there's something seemingly resisting you. You can still do it, but something seems to bolster her resistance to that. Um, that spell, that, that, that ability. And uh, basically she rolled an advantage. All the undead in the catacombs and in Strahd's tomb rolled an advantage. Now initially I had said the turn the undead was just impossible, but given how things went, I decided that wasn't the case. Um, so <laughs> they, uh, they, um, um, they got pretty lucky. Uh, as, as you'll see going through here, they got pretty lucky. But still, this encounter with, with her was a, was a tense one. They all fired, they all attacked. Um, Arthur managed to hide before she came in there, and he jumped out and got a sneak attack off, so he did a bunch of damage. Um, and uh, and uh, I think um, I think Abner got a good couple hits with his sword, and so she dropped pretty low, and then she leapt on Abner and killed him. And that was it. Abner was just dead, because he had one hit point left. She did his uh, blood drain, uh, drained him for like, whatever, four or five uh, constitution points, and the way I'm running NPCs in this game was, because I'm doing the different hit points, I, I decided that for every con point that they drained by a vampire loss, that was one turn off of their death timer. So, you know, to, to a minimum of less than zero, right? So they could, they, that if they went unconscious, they would die straight up. And so Abner lost all four charges of his death timer, all four plus one. And uh, then when he went down, I rolled and he was at minus whatever, five, and so he, he died straight up. So when he went to zero hit points, he was out. And that meant that they couldn't use the greatsword because that was their their he was their source of damage for that. I mean, he's doing two d twelve basically two attacks because I'm using an NPC staff lock. He's using a plus one greatsword two attacks a turn with a magic greatsword, the you know, Strahd sword, and so that was a huge source of damage that she just lost because none of them could use it. Uh, the NPCs could use it at disadvantage. I said that the uh, the Titus could because he's a soldier in his background. They said, yeah, you can use it at disadvantage. But he had zero strength, or maybe he had a plus one. So plus one at disadvantage wasn't very good. And the best that they could look at normally, um, uh, Van Richten would have had a plus two uh, without, or yeah, plus two at disadvantage. That would have been better. But he had had his strength drained. And so he was at zero. He was, I think he was at yeah, 10 strength. And so he, he couldn't, he would be zero at, at a disadvantage. So they're, 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 one of their massive damage dealers just went down, an NPC, and he's gone. 
Uh, and it was very, it was, it was interesting. It was such an interesting moment because it contrasted in my mind. It contrasted, looking back on it, with the very first death of the campaign, which was their coach driver. Because in the first death of the campaign, their coach driver died. This was a guy they didn't know. They spent time with him. They, they like tried to bury him. They put him in the coffin. Like they were like, we have to take care of this guy. We can't just, we can't just leave him here. We can't just leave his body. And when Abner died, the first thing that the party did was cut off his head. <laughs> They were like, nope, we don't want a vampire. Dead. <laughs> Move on. It was such an interesting contrast from the beginning of the campaign to the end. They're both playing in character the whole time. But just that, that sense of desperation, the sense of we have to do what we have to do now, was so much stronger. And I loved it. I thought it was great. Because Abner has been their companion since Kresik. He's fought for them. He's sided with them. He's saved them on a couple of occasions. Or he really saved them during the battle with the uh, the undead, uh, the, the golems, I should say. The flesh golems beneath the Abbey of St. Markovia. He has been there for them, and he's dedicated. He's risked his life with them and for them, and, and done a ton of damage. So they've seen his value, and he's dead. And their first reaction is cut off his head, and move on. Sentiment later, got to move. It was so good. Now, when they defeated um, the the vampire, um, they um, saw that her wraith form, her mist form, right, started going off towards one direction. They were like, follow it. Follow it, follow it, follow it, because they're like, look, if, if she can, chances are she's buried next to Strahd, right? She's his bride, so chase after him, chase after him, and so they did. And they chased after her, and they, they saw that she went to this, this place in the wall where there was a little crack, and she went through the crack in the wall. And it was, um, you know, on either side was a statue. One was of this beautiful old, older woman, you know, like a crown on her head, you know, like, uh, looked vaguely like the pictures they'd seen of Strahd, but, you know, more patronly and older. And the other side was a man that was kind of like Strahd too, different features, but had similar ones and was also older. And she had a crown and he didn't. And written on the wall behind him was crown the king or crown the king to pass on or something like that. And they were like, oh no, we have to go back up to that crown in the throne room? Really? No. <laughs> They saw it and they were like, that's just, we don't have time. By this point, it was like 4.30 and they were like, look, that's another hour. It'll be 5.30, we'll have an hour maybe. And that's assuming we don't get knocked out or, or attacked or anything on the way. We're going to fight on the way. We'll lose some people. We can't afford that. So they were like, look, there has to be a mechanism, right? If there's some sort of, if there's some sort of secret door, there's got to be a mechanism to open it. So search around. And so they searched around and they got a, they got a pretty high roll for their search. And so I said, yes, there's a, there's a mechanism behind it. You can see And they were like, well, can Arthur as a thief, can he like manipulate it? Can he unlock the door? And I was like, all right, you can try. And he rolled like a 22. And I was like, it was an extreme check. He got the 22. All right. Yeah. You unlock the door and the thing slides open and they see now what I had, to, what I had written in here is just not what I ended up describing because I'd, I'd ended up wanting something much more um, dramatic. So part of it was right, but part of it wasn't. So I said, I did, in fact, there was this sort of steps led down from the catacombs into a large underground chamber. There was no illumination, it was pitch black. The air is heavy and there's feeling being watched. That's certainly true. Now, the um, way I described it, though, was that there was a sort of a bit of a landing and then steps leading down. But on the landing and on the steps, there were just coffins, like 13 of them. Some of them open, some of them closed, all of them inhabited by figures. And uh, one of them had Aldwin, which is Arthur's brother. Very clearly a vampire, very clearly dead. And they were like, oh man. And it was this really kind of gut punch for Arthur because they had he had come into the castle thinking Aldwin's dead, for sure. And then he had gone up all the way to um, the, the reception room and there was a map there and it had people's names marked on it where they were and an old woman was on there in the castle and he thought, oh, he might be still alive. Maybe he's in the dungeons. Maybe he's, they're saving him for the ritual. He's still alive. And then they got here. Nope. Strahd has fed on him. Great. Great. Now, at the bottom of the steps was a, um, a larger chamber held up by four pillars uh, and there was, in the center of the room, there was a pool of blood, basically, bubbling blood in the middle of the room. And then just beyond that, the very other side of the room on a little dais was a gothic, huge, heavy black sarcophagus with um, clasps that had marked, were marked with slightly, very, 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 very slightly glowing runes. And then there were also three other coffins in the room. And one of those coffins had the form of the, the, uh, the, the vampire that they had just fought. 
So they went over to her and they staked her and cut her head off because she, they knew she was in zero hit points. And they're like, okay, good. Now the question was, they were like, what do we do? Do we f try to do this to each vampire? Do we stake each one? Uh, because they, they had experience with the vampire spawn and they knew that if they're at zero hit points, then staking them uh, kills them or staking them begins the process of killing them and they cut off their head. So, but if they're not at zero hit points, then staking them hurts them, yeah, but then they leap up and the stake kind of like is rejected by their body. So you have to hurt them down to the point where they can, where they, where the stake will keep them down. They, so they knew that. And they're like, so if we just stake all these things, then we're going to fight them all. But if we don't, then what if we open that coffin and all of them wake up and we have to fight 13 spawn, three vampires or two vampires now, and then Strahd himself. We can't do that. So they were like, let's ignore the spawn and let's go for the other two vampires. Now, they made a very bad decision here. It didn't, didn't hurt them as much as it could have, but it, they made a very bad decision. They decided to fight both at once. They decided to stake them both at once. And that was just a mistake because instead of fighting one at a time, they fought both. So they, 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 they woke up Gertruda and Escher, who were both down here. Now, I had originally thought that Escher was back in Velaki, but I realized, no, no. Well, actually, he probably should have been there, but regardless, I, I had him down here. Um, so Escher was there and Gertruda was there. Was there. And uh, really, it should have just been Gertruda, but that's fine. So they staked both of them. Uh, they reacted. Now, Van Richten had an ability, which is uh, his last spell he had left, which is Snare basically, which is a humanoid, but I decided it worked on any creature. It's very powerful, but it's all he had. And so he just picked Escher, and he was like, hold him. And as long as he could hold him, he could hold him. And uh, they were like, he was like, go, kill the other one, and then come back. And so he would, Van Richten just held Escher down, while the rest, every room, he, every turn, he just focused and did that. The others rushed and just you know, tried to take down Gertrude. She only got one round. She got her charm off once, and it didn't work. Um... Uh, uh, Arthur, I think, was the one she targeted. Arthur saved and just ignored it. And uh, then they just took her down. Um, by this point, they were desperate. They used everything they had, or they were using everything that they had. But they managed to take her down. They were smiting her. They were using uh, Acid Arrow. They were using um, uh, the uh, the Cursed Knight's Curse, or the Knight of St. Idris, which is a Cursed Knight in this game. Um, Ar uh, Varya, she was using her curse. <laughs> and she realized, by the way, about halfway through the fight, she realized that for the whole campaign, she hadn't been adding up her numbers right. So meaning that for this, for like for, for the last like three sessions, she sh should have been getting a plus 10 to hit because of her dex bonus, because of her bonus from the Cursed Knight. Um, and because of her talent, she had been ignoring her talent. She'd rolled the same talent every time, which was plus one to ranged attacks, or plus one to melee attacks. Um, and she had been ignoring that. So she had she had been doing plus six instead of plus four for this like fast three sessions. Or instead of plus six, instead of plus 10 to hit. And she was like, I'm so sorry, guys. It was really funny. Um, so anyway, she realized that, and that probably helped them <laughs> in the final fight. And so they were going against... Um, they were just trying to take down each of these. And they took down Gertruda, then they focused on, on um, Escher, and they took him down. Uh, that's right. So at the very end, that's right, Van Richten lost Snare. Near the very end, near the fight, the end of the fight, he lost Snare. And so I think Escher had one round, and he damaged Van Richten. I, he hit him maybe down to like one hit point, and he might have damaged somebody else. But that was it. They killed them both. And it was just, it was really just luck. I mean, because I was rolling straight up and Van Richten was holding on to his spell. And uh, Esmeralda was, or um, I should say, uh, Gertruda was just taken down really quick by their attacks. So that left them with the final seal. And I forgot that Van Richten actually had the one other spell, which was um, basically dispel. He had to dispel a magic spell. And so he broke the seals. Because they, the t Titus saw that they were marked with alarm, basically. And he's like, okay, so if we touch any of those, all of these things are waking up. And that was exactly what would have happened. If they had just broken the seals, then all of the vampires at the top of the stairs, those 13 spawn, would have all woken up. Um, oh, I forgot. During the fight, they rolled a random encounter because Arthur kept shooting his gun, and so it was loud, and so I kept having them roll. And they rolled a random encounter, and so I had, I had, I rolled for the spawn to wake up, and three of them woke up. But then, um, um, basically, um, Ansgar used to turn undead over and over and managed to keep them in the back and then destroyed them eventually with Turn Undead. Because he's level 5 and Vampire Spawn at level 5, so he can destroy them with that spell because they're his level or lower. So they finally had dealt with three of the spawns. There were 10 still up there. And then they had killed the two vampires on either side. They staked them and cut their heads off. So that left just Strahd. The seals were broken. They did all the spell casting they could. They did a quick, like, you know, um, blessed weapon, magic weapon as much as they could around the room. Uh, gave, you know, uh, holy waters out 
opened up the tomb, there he was. And they started off, they're like, well, staking him at least hurts him. So let's start off that way. Stake him and, and, and holy water him. <laughs> and so they started off the fight that way. And I ignored this. I should have done this. I just completely forgot. I was too wrapped up in the uh, in the uh, thing. But the uh, dark whispers mutter in the heads of those who approach Savers of Strahd's effect, charm effect. I should have done that. But I didn't. I just forgot it. <laughs> so it, as it turned out, it wasn't necessary. But So this, the fight begins. They win initiative. And they do, a good, they, good, they do a good round to him. Now Arthur had been hidden and he jumped out and did like 20 points of damage with sneak attack, which was great. Um, sneak attack... I have ruled uh, as long as you take a turn, if you're a thief, you take a turn to hide, you make a, wisdom, uh, a dex check, and then immediately the target that you want to shoot or the next turn when you shoot, they, they make a wisdom check versus whatever you rolled. And if they roll higher than you, then you actually didn't hide from them, and so you can't get a sneak attack off on them. But if you can, if, you, if, you, if they don't, then you can get another sneak attack off. That's how I've been ruling it, at least for this campaign. Basically, it's a, it's a pretty high risk, high reward because it takes a turn to hide and if you roll low, low or the guy rolls high, then you don't get the turn to sneak attack off anyway. So you've just wasted a whole turn. So it's a it's a sort of you know, every other round big punch sort of thing. I don't know if I would do that in a regular campaign. I allowed it here because I thought, man, Strahd has 70 hit points. And 70 hit points in, in Shadow Dark is incredible. I mean, a lot of hit points. So I was like, I don't know if they're... <laughs> I think they're just straight up dead anyway. So uh, he jumps up. First thing he does is take down Titus. Takes him down. Uh, Titus goes down. Titus has like four con points left. He drains some of the hit points back. Van Richten uses his turn to run over and use their last healing potion on Titus. So Titus gets back up. They're out of healing potions. Uh, they all begin to fight as best they can. Now, one of the things that I had talked about beforehand, the session, I had gone to Varya, the character, the player who played Varya, and I said, look, you channel spirits. Would you be okay if Tatiana's spirit, that white ethereal form, came to you during the fight or right at the beginning of the fight. And I mentioned, by the way, that when as soon as she used his, her curse, she saw it hovering there by the stairs. and uh, Or she saw it there. And as soon as she used her curse, it rushed at her to try to inhabit her. And I said, do you let her in? And I said beforehand, if you do, um, I think there will be a benefit you know, for, for the fight. So just give you a heads up. I probably shouldn't have done that. I probably just should have let it happen. But I, I didn't want her to be like, what? Like, they're not fit. And, I, and she really liked it. And the party as a whole really liked it. So... Tatiana's spirit inhabited the, the cursed knight, Varium, who, that's her whole thing, she channels spirits. And for one round, she just pointed. And Strahd froze. As he saw this, as he saw Tatiana, he just froze. So he lost his turn. And that was my, like, okay, that's their, that's their best shot. I was like, like they're going to get an extra turn where Strahd doesn't do anything. And at the end of that turn, they had done, like, maybe seven more damage to him. <laughs> and so he was at, like, I don't know, 27, 28 damage. Um, no, he was, he had been bloodied. That's right. Cause they had done, they had done some good damage to him. So maybe he was at like 35. I think he was at like 35 or 34 damage. So it was like, you know, okay, they're barely, barely halfway and he gets to go again on his next turn. So they rolled initiative. I'm doing again, round initiative on a D6. And I think he got a five or a, or a six or something like that. He got a six. They got a five and he made three attacks and he attacked three people. He attacked everybody once and he um, didn't kill anybody he missed I think uh, Ansgar because Ansgar has protection from good and evil focused on so he had disadvantage on that so I think he missed Ansgar he hit um, I don't think he hit Titus either I think he no he did hit Titus um, uh, and brought Titus down to like two hit points one hit point or something like that it was really close he drained a little hit points back and then he uh, he hit Varya and did a little damage to Varya too. So, but he was you know because a D six a D eight damage minus the con, and I like that fact because the con doesn't go from their hit points, doesn't knock them out, but it can kill them straight up. And so as the the two basically their their window of life disappears, and so they were taking some hit point damage, but they were also losing their con, so their reserves were disappearing. And I really liked that; it felt very very tense. And then we did their their turn, and Arthur, who had hidden the round before, jumps out. Rolls like a 14 to hit with his with his gun. So he's going to miss because our, our Strahd is a 15 AC. And he's like, guys, I gotta, I can't miss this. This is my sneak attack. This is my last round of, of uh, Blessed Weapon or the, the Cleansing Weapon. Uh, we, I forget which effect it was, Magic Weapon. The, the, the clerics, you know, make your weapon a, a, a Magic Weapon for a round, for a few rounds. It was his last round of it. And he's like, guys, I ha I'm going to be useless after this. Does anyone have anything? So they had one last luck point and they gave it to him. And he rolled a nat 20. 
He rolled a nat 20 on his sneak attack. He critically hit with a sneak attack and did 46 damage. He rolled, it was almost the highest damage he possibly could have. I don't think he rolled below a four. He rolled fours, fives, and sixes for his d6s. And he had like 10 d6 because of his, I think he had five d6 normally because of the thief attack and he doubles it to 10 d6. That one shot killed Strahd. And in addition to that round, uh, I think Titus also got a nat 20. No, he, maybe, you know, he didn't get... They, they were getting lots of natural 20s around the fight, but they didn't get it that round, I think, Titus. But anyway, he also... And then Avaria also hit. And that was like 13 damage from that. So between them, it was like 59 damage in one round. And I had to try that 70. I wasn't going to boost his hit points. So they killed him. It was simultaneously anticlimactic for me because I was like, well, no one else died. But it was also so incredible. The odds of that. And the, the visual image of that, right? Aldwin uh, in Arthur's mind as, he has, you know, Strahd knocks somebody to the ground. He's about to leap on him. Arthur stands up with his pistol, takes a shot. The bullet impacts the smoking gun right there as Strahd stumbles back with his magic blessed gun um, from Ansgar's power. It's a great image. Well, Strahd misted back into his coffin. They staked him and cut his head off. And as soon as they did, the entire place started to crumble. And so they had to get out. So the way that I ruled it was, okay, I wanted it to be dramatic. And I said, okay, you guys have to, essentially I did sort of like a, a skill check. I kind of brought in some fourth edition here. I was like, here's what you have to do. Every room that you guys pass through, somebody has to make a check. And we're going to go in a cycle of the four of you. You all have to make checks. You know, you can choose who goes first, and then you can choose of the three remaining who goes next. And you can choose of the two remaining who goes, and, but then the last person has to go. And you have to cycle through all six abilities. They all have to be used. So, um, you know, on your on your time, you can choose which one of the which one of the six you want to use. But once it's used, you can't be used until the other five have been used. And so it was sort of like this this check. And that's for each room that you pass through. And for every room that you fail, someone takes a D eight damage. That was, and I said the DC was fifteen. So this is, was very hard, very hard for them to get out. Uh, without taking damage, without dying. And in fact, on the way out, two characters died. Van Richten got crushed, and Ansgar sacrificed himself. To He said, I want to take the damage. Because they said they failed the check, and he was like, I want to take it. Because normally I was rolling to see randomly who, who took the damage in each room. And he jumped in front of the falling thing and got killed. So Ansgar died, Van Richten died. But Esmeralda, Titus, Varya, and Arthur all made it out. It was very dramatic. They, they had to navigate their way out through the, the, the crumbling castle as things were falling around them. You know, people were taking damage. They ran across the cult. That was one of the checks that uh, Varya made was a charisma check to be like, hey, don't you know, don't get in our way. Don't don't fight us. We're, we're all trying to get out of here. And she succeeded. Um, it was really cool. It was really, really cool. And the final moment of the of the of the session, the final moment of the campaign was them running across the bridge. They'd gotten through the portcullis. Um, uh, running across the bridge as it collapsed behind them, making it to the far side and turning around and watching as the last bits of the castle crumbled down to the ground. The last spire of Ravenloft fell. And that was the end of the campaign. So, I mean, just so dramatic, so awesome. Losing, you know, uh, there's a couple of NPCs and then Ansgar. Um, really, Varya easily could have died. Uh, she took damage in one of the rooms and she had two hit points left by the end. And so it, it, it dealt four damage to her instead of, and she, if it had done six, she would have died. Uh, Titus had like two hit points. Arthur still had 10. He was actually fine. He didn't get hit that whole final fight. So he was actually okay. Um, Esmeralda was like, was it like one or two hit points left? So, I mean, they, any of them, if they had failed a couple more of those checks, it would have been a couple more characters dead. So really awesome of kind of final dramatic moments as they escape from the crumbling castle. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was kind of funny because one of my characters had to go like right then. He was like, oh man, I got to go. Ah, all right, well, we, we, got, we got to do like an epilogue because we got to keep going. We got to keep talking about this. And so that's why we were going to do another one because we didn't have time then to kind of do that epilogue. But man, it was so cool. <laughs> I had so much fun running it. And even with the sort of like Strahd being a little bit anticlimactic as a villain because, you know, he's been there in the background the whole time and they get like three rounds of combat with him and then they kill him. <laughs> um, I didn't mind. Because of the epic moment, because of the critical hit, because of how desperate it was and how the whole campaign had been a bit like that, right? Either they win or they die. Like, that had been their, their feeling. And this is how they felt. They're like, look, if we don't get 
if we don't kill him quickly, we just all die. So we have to kill him quickly. And so this moment of like, oh yeah, this moment of success, it felt very dramatic, especially after the low, the low, the low of we're dead, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead. Boom, critical hit on a sneak attack. Oh man, it was just, it was just awesome. Really, really cool. So anyway, that's going to be it for this series. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as I've been going through. I, I know I have. <laughs> I've enjoyed playing it. I've enjoyed talking about it. As I said, I'll do one more episode, uh, one more video on this where I go through sort of the finale or the, the sort of a retrospective and, and epilogue thoughts and things like that. But uh, I'll do that after we have our epilogue. So that way I can get their thoughts on it and, and maybe share some of their perspectives if, if, if that's interesting. All right, guys. Well, as I said, hope it's been interesting. And I'll see you guys in another video.